So what I will talk today is really about basically um, application of our effort a little bit, and I'll try to keep it short and simple. I will not go into deep of the data, so feel free to ask me questions. So basically really using uh, genomics and bioinformatics to really create a high throughput data sets and then use informatic approaches to really mine in a hypothesis-free um, manner the data sets and really try to come and find some things about human brain development. I will divide my this, uh, presentation in three parts. First, I will tell you why we are using this approach. Secondly, I will tell you about the data set we created. And in third part, I will show you a vignette, really several vignettes in, of examples of how we mine the data set and what kind of the data and some new interesting and even hypothesis that can be generated based on that data set. So, uh, do I need to turn this on? Oh. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll start. So, there are basically four problems one faces when one wants to study human brain development. The first couple of problems are really related to the nature of human brain as biological tissue. That's first one, it's complex, and many of our, my colleagues actually showed you examples of how that complexity is uh, both in development. And the second one, which I really would like to emphasize, it's a very protracted process. And to illustrate it, I'm going to show you this slide. So if you uh, put time on a logarithmic scale, so this is basically prenatal development, this is postnatal development, you can divide it into phases such as embryonic, fetal development, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. And now we're just looking at the really structural development of human brain. You can see that basically takes several, seven months and your brain is still smooth, okay? And then when you are born, you have most of your primary secondary gyri, even some tertiary one. But what is really interesting actually, that your brain will grow three times in size in the next first five years of your postnatal life. And even then, <laughs> you are still making connections. You are making myelin probably into late adolescence. So that tells you how. And if you look at the, some of the major cellular events, such as neurogenesis, migration, synaptogenesis, and axonal growth and myelination, you can see that they are spread across the time. So basically, it takes several months, around five months, to create the entire repertoire of neurons in the human cerebral cortex. That's five months, basically. It will take seven days to do that all in mice. Okay, so that tells you what is the really complexity. It's not just a number. Another interesting thing about human development, if you take a mouse, everything is compacted within several weeks. So, once you, as Tomomi showed, when you are creating layer four, thalamocortical fibers are already in the cortex. Well, they are not, actually. In, in human brain, you already create layer four. They wait there, sit there. And so this is why human brain came up with some of the really specializations, such as a huge subplay zone where the axons are waiting, that the entire component of the cerebral cortex is generated. And I think that this is a really unexplored aspect of human development, because if you take this, you know, it's called principle of heterochrony. If you take the same events and you stretch them or you compact them, you can come up with some different variations and species specific. The other two sets of problems, actually, major problems, are related to basically ethical and tech, you know, limitations that human brain, basically, you cannot do experimentation. And the last problem is really, even if you want to do it, it's actually really not hard. It's hard to collect high quality tissue due to many reasons that I explained. So, so several years ago, actually almost a decade, <laughs> um, I stayed at the same place and I really, it was a great time and I think in my opinion, technology is the major force that drives science. That's just my opinion. I think ideas are becoming cheap, and what really changes science is technology. When I started my lab, like, here comes high throughput genomics. And I said, wow, I can combine these two, you know, my love and passion for human brain and really with that. And was fortunate that actually there were really people who knew what they need to do at Yale and really helped me to build that. And in the last several years, that became, grew into something, uh, and there is a consortium now of several universities listed here and it's called the Brainspan, so you can go there and there is a, an atlas. Atlas is maintained by Allen Institute for Brain Research, and you can, there are many other things in addition to uh, things that I will talk today. And so, the first thing I did is we collected a large collection of a human brain, post-mortem human brains, that covered the entire aspect of the development, both prenatal and postnatal lifespan. So basically from five weeks of post-conception all the way to over 80 years, and so we have around 200 brains, 
And as you can see, there are really there are dramatic changes in how that looks. We divided the development into 15 periods, just for uh, an adulthood, just for a purpose of, of, of really trying to obtain multiple specimens, males and females. And so part of our, our part of this entire consortium and some previous work was to really uh, profile 16 areas or regions of the human brain. Of course, you can immediately come to conclusion that my favorite part of the brain is the neocortex. So we sampled 11 neocortical areas. We were guided by two principles, functional importance. So there, is a, there are four areas of the prefrontal cortex, all major sensory areas, and some of the areas involved in association temporal and parietal. And also we are guided by ability to dissect this. So these were all dissected from post-mortem human brain that were collected from clinically unremarkable uh, donors. In addition, hippocampus, amygdala, striatum, mid dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, and the cerebral cortex. In addition to looking at the gene expression or transcriptome, dynamics, uh, my lab and several of other groups have looked at many other aspects of human brain development, including reference atlas, histology, epigenome, genome, and so, and you can all get most of this in Brainspan Atlas. So, so, I will specifically tell you a little bit about what we have learned and uh, looking at the gene expression, and I'll try to keep it simple and short. So, basically, uh, the data set that we have been really focused on creating is uh, basically around 58 clinically unremarkable specimens. The 58 were based on covering all 15 periods. Uh, in each period, we had multiple males and females, and um, we also tried to, we have very rigorous uh, QC uh, <clears throat> protocol to really include, they were all neuropathologically examined by a trained neuropathologist. We dissected around 30, over 1,300 uh, samples from these brains, uh, half males, half females, most of are European, some African-American, Hispanic, Asians, and in many cases, it's mixed. Uh, so we applied three types of, of analysis. One is genome. So all of them were snipped uh, one, uh, uh, um, genotype using a high-density SNP arrays. And recently, we have also done whole genome sequencing using a brain uh, cerebellum-derived DNA. We have also looked at the major uh, histone modification marks and DNA methylation. So this way, we can look at the, some of the epigenetic changes. And transcriptome, we use two basic platforms. One is exon uh, microarrays, which primarily looks at the protein coding genes. And also we did RNA-seq, which was done on slightly half of the samples. And the reason it's half, because in exon arrays, we look at the left and right side. And in RNA-seq, we look only on one side. And it will be clear why at the end of the talk. So that's the data set. And then what I will show you in my last part is just cup several vignettes of type of data we have derived. And many cases, I think, will illustrate complexity of the human brain development and some new ideas about what could be happening in human brain and some species differences. So this is a multidimensional scaling plot, okay, in which we plot 1,350 uh, dots. Each dot represents one sample. Okay? And so what we are looking at is the relationship of the transcriptome. Okay? This is not individual gene. This is a or protein coding genes. In this case, it's 17,000 because that's how many were on exon arrays, and we slightly get more on RNA-seq. Not all genes are expressed. And this is a basically plot, and then we can paint it using periods. Remember, period one is an early embryonic period, while period 15 is late ad adulthood. And you can see that basically, basically what we are looking is how related are each dots to each other, looking at the whole transcriptome as, as a comparison. And you can see that basically, uh, you can plot it by period, and you can see that major dimensional variance is actually related to time. So basically, and you can also paint it by regions. Uh, we compressed all 11 neocortical areas into one color, otherwise it's impossible to see the colors. So these are multiple neocortical areas, and you can see beautiful segregation. Neocortex is here, cerebellum is here, and you can see the... But if you look at compare these two graphs, you can see that actually major variance in this dimension is time. And what is surprising is this. This is period seven, is light green samples. Okay, these are all different areas. Now they are painted by time, and in this corner they are painted by regions. And actually two-thirds of the variance actually can be explained just pre prenatal development. So first, basically 10 months of your life are the most dynamic. And then comes the infancy, and this is 20 years to 80. 
it's all compressed. So that tells you basically that gene expression changes less during prenatal development, uh, uh, changes during postnatal development, and the least during adulthood. The most of the differences happens during post, uh, prenatal development. And that is the problem, because actually this is the least what we know about the prenatal development, due to many reasons, and one of them is really collecting high quality tissue. So, uh, in addition, actually, to time region, you can do this by using sex and inter-individual variances, but the major, actually, global difference is time, then comes region, and sex, and individual. So, one of the tools that we have been using to really mine this data in an unbiased manner was really using a, um, a gene co-expression network, and specifically weighted gene co-expression network, which is pioneered by Steve Horvath in 2005 at UCLA, and used by many colleagues, including Dan Geschwin and, and myself and many others and people at Allen Institute. And so basically what we are looking at is spatial temporal variance. You know, we are trying to com collect, uh, com um, <clears throat> see whether there is an organization of, of gene expression dynamics using a variance across time and, 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 and regions. And basically, uh, using, depending on what parameters you use, you can come up with the hundreds of these networks or modules, and what they are contain of genes that have same behavior. It's basically that's how Google makes money. They know that I like guitar and red wine and my, my, my wife likes shoes. And so basic similar principle, you probably know more than me about it. And so basically you can now organize these genes into large or small modules. Modules come in two basically, they are either very large, and here are two largest ones in the human uh, developmental brain transcriptome. M means module, two is just an arbitrary number that we give it. So M2 is a large over 3,000 genes, and they all behave pretty much the same. And so this is a basically PC1. You can even create their eigengene. And so all they do is that they are expressed low in during fetal development. They go up each plateau around childhood, early childhood, and they stay pretty much the same in all neocortical, uh, in all regions of the brain that we have analyzed, okay? You can actually even find another large, which is M20. It's again large, developmentally regulated, but this network is around also 3,000 genes, slightly less, I think. So, uh, and what it does is basically all of these genes are basically being downregulated across the entire. And so the second thing we can do with this type of analysis, we can then do functional notation. So we, now what is, we know what is the list of the genes. We can rank them by basically how close is their uh, uh, dynamics to eigengene or PC1. And basically, then we can look at also enrichment of gene ontologies using David and other similar um, databases. And so, for example, for genes that are going up as you mature, you can see that most of them are enriched for membrane proteins, calcium signaling, synaptic transmission, as you would expect, okay? Because your brain is maturing, you're creating synapses. On the other hand, Genes that are upregulated when you are creating neurons are mainly genes related to z uh, zinc finger um, transcription factor and SOC transcription factor. My other work that I'm not going to talk today has shown that many of these are important for specifying a, a neuronal identities. So you can clearly see that these are not just meaningless networks or modules, that there are really some meaningless. And in addition to these large ones that are, you know, you can also create or get many that are small, handful of genes that are really going up or down depending on the time or region and in specific, and I'll show you an example later on. So now the other interesting thing, which was one of my most disappointing things, and this is why I like hypothesis free. So the reason we did this whole entire study, my primary motivation was find left and right asymmetry. <laughs> Human brain is incredibly asymmetric. I mean, functionally, structurally, comparing to other species. And so we decided, okay, let's do left and right. And many, many years of painstaking work created nothing statistically significant which was really absolutely shocking to me, okay? And so here are two types of analysis we have done to tell you that sometimes hypothesis free is probably the best. So what you see here is a each region that we have analyzed. So these are, the, oh, in this case, I'm just showing you neocortical areas. So this is a, a medial prefrontal cortex orbital, those are lateral, this is Broca. This corresponds to primary auditory, which you all know that's highly, uh, <clears throat> And this is a uh, superior uh, temporal gyrus, which would correspond to Wernicke language areas. And you can see that we have covered really areas that are highly functionally as well as structurally asymmetric. And so this is a heat map basically showing fall differences. And you can see that majority of the gene basically fall within you no. Know, we see a lot of variations, left and right, in individual brains, but at the population level, nothing passes even the, re you know, the most relaxed statistical criteria. So, I, so 
one thing in mind, that we are looking at the population, we are grounding the tissue, so that's also another thing that you have to keep in mind. And secondly, we do see variation, but unfortunately, nothing is consistent at population level, using even same ethnicity, you know, same periods and stuff like that. Another, as many of you probably know, there have been a lot of literature showing, okay, maybe one other model of, of left and right asymmetries that left and right hemispheres mature differently. That has been shown using functional studies. So here is a plot of left and right. So what we are looking at individual neocortical areas transcriptomes, okay? Uh, we can do this based on individual genes or whole transcriptomes. So in this case, just to show you global data. So the left trajectories of individual areas are shown either in dashed or, or uh, full line. And you can see that they all basically behave the same and there is no statistical difference in maturational trajectories. So what we are showing here is that at the population level, if you look at individual areas, there is no anything statistically significant and that their maturation trajectories are similar left and right. Now, there are many, many consequences of this finding and, and we are happy to discuss if you are interested. So, another thing that really we were interested in doing this is, and Tomomi really beautifully, I mean, I'm actually very happy that she gave a talk before me because I it will save me a couple of minutes explaining. She showed you also examples that we actually have around 20,000 protein coding genes. I mean, we share them all with platypus. I mean, there are very few genes that are really unique to human brain, and I'm not sure that they are even meaningful. Okay, that's my honest, just opinion, just the number. And we see tremendous variety and, and variations in morphological development. We see it in cognitive development. And it basically, it has been long known from Wilson and King in 1975 that basically what probably creates all of this is a spatial temporal variations in gene expression. And that was another reason why we were motivated to do this. And Tomomi showed you the same gene that basically is slightly differently expressed in different species. And I think this is something very important. And so human cortex, as you probably know, probably has more areas than other species that are commonly used in laboratory, uh, in laboratory such as non-human primates or, or rodents. And so we are motivated to look at what's happening in dynamic of this aerial expression pattern. And so if you cluster these areas, so this is a clustering of 11 neocortical areas, hierarchical clustering, unsupervised, based on their whole transcriptome. And you can see that we can cluster them by lobes as well. So for example, this is a prefrontal cortex. This is a motor, primary motor, primary sensor. They are next to each other anatomically. But what's really also exciting is that you can also cluster areas that belong to different uh, in addition to topographic, nearest neighbor, you can also cluster them based on whether they are functionally more related. Because ITC is part of the temporal cortex, but here we see clustering of angular gyrus, uh, primary auditory, and superior temporal, which are basically all important for functional posterior language areas and speech and language. So the first thing we look at, actually, the number of genes expressed actually is slightly less as you mature. But it's not really a big difference. But what was really surprising to us when we look at how much of difference do you see between areas? I mean, if you look at Tomomi's slides, you know, the, please forgive me, you know, like when you're sleep deprived, you forget the name of the gene, so, BD, yeah, exactly. You can see that it's actually highly enriched in sensory areas, but there are variations across the species, but also there are variations, and that's how she fished out that gene across the development. So we look at how different are neocortical areas across the entire development. And surprising, this has not been done in the mouse or any other species, but our data set allows us to do that. And so basically what we are now plotting is how many genes are differentially expressed between two neocortical areas. Keep in mind that the number of expressed genes really, it's slightly less in mature brain, but it's basically pretty much similar, okay? And this is what happens. On average, there are basically almost 1,000, a little bit less than 1,000 genes that are differentially expressed, okay? But when it comes to early development, postnatal development, infancy in childhood, that drops dramatically and then goes up again in adolescence and adulthood. And so basically the shape is not that it goes more fetal and progressively less, it actually does this U-shaped curve, okay? Which suggests that actually, and it's consistent with previous data I showed you, that most of the differences are present postnatally, but what happens is that it has this big dip and then again goes up and basically has this temporal hourglass pattern. And this is a Manhattan plot, and basically it's a tacky test, basically looking at how many combinations are of these genes between two different areas. And you can see actually, and also what we are now looking at, what are all the areas created equally when it comes to this differential expression, or some are a little bit more differentially expressed and driving this differential expression. And you can see that actually that some areas have more differential expressed genes 
And here is the example. So medial prefrontal, okay? Uh, ventral, uh, ventral latter, this is a corresponding to frontal opericum, which should be prospective broca language area or premotor. And look at this visual, primary visual, and temporal cortex. Those are basically areas that are driving mostly differential expression in the, in the fetal development. And then suddenly, the drop does not happen at birth. That was the second surprising finding. The drop does not happen. Actually, I don't know exactly when it happens because, unfortunately, we don't have tissue between 24 and 35. It's just impossible to collect it for reasons of heroic medicine in the United States. But we predict that drop happens in between 24 weeks of post-conception and 35. Now, instead of having several thousand, you basically drop to basically, uh, you know, a few dozen of differential express genes. So this drop does not happen. It happens before birth. Okay, and then this drop stays actually relatively constant, okay? So it's, there are still genes that are differentially expressed and consistent, especially between primary sensory areas. And then it gone goes up, and not all areas are actually going up equally. Again, it's mainly driven by medial prefrontal cortex and primary visual cortex. So, now, what are the genes that are driving this temporal hourglass? And so basically, we Look at, you again, use a network analysis and to find. And so basically, we can again cluster genes. And basically, so these are the modules. Don't worry about the numbers. But what we observed is actually exactly what I was showing you, that many of these modules are, uh, you know, sometimes hands, a handful of genes, sometimes a, a few dozen of genes. Really, actually, they are all co-regulated in the same regions, but also what we observe that are dependent on the time. This is period three, which corresponds to early fetal development. So this is a set of genes that is highly upregulated in lateral parts of the prefrontal cortex, and they are all down in non-prefrontal areas. We can find a set of genes that are actually doing this in the temporal areas. We can see that only doing in primary visual areas or medial areas, and on and on and on, okay? Another feature, which I'll show you just one example later, that most of these are temporally regulated, as you would expect, because remember that temporal hourglass shape is actually almost completely disappears. And here is an example of one module, M91. So it's a set of genes that are all highly expressed in a prefrontal area, so this is a clustering. And then basically, somewhere in between six and period seven, that this pattern is completely turned on. So they are all probably somehow co-regulated, either by some transcriptional mechanism, gene regulatory network, or activity, or we don't know what it is. On the other hand, many of the genes that are temporarily regulated and spatially regulated during prenatal development actually turn on in all areas. So there is like a gradient. So that's a basically two basic flavors. Another important thing, I'm not going to show you any data just for the sake of time. When we did the same analysis for postnatal development, especially adolescents and other, we actually had no gradients. Majority of gene expression modules were, were either related to sensory versus non-sensory areas or were expressed across the entire cortex and related to either sex differences or some other difference. So, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because you can also do one other thing. You can give me a piece of prenatal tissue and I can tell you exactly how old is the brain and what is the part of the brain using six, 11 areas. Because each of them have a very unique uh, transcriptional signature, and it's actually changing across the time, and you can divide. And at that time, it's very hard to find that there are no anatomical borders. Brain is completely smooth, I mean, cortex. And what is really important, that many of these genes, and the moment showed you some of them, are actually, uh, have been linked to major uh, psychiatric disorders, and some of them we have actually also studied in our human genetic studies. Uh, when we look at the transcript variants, I mean, all genes that if you have two axons, you will be spliced at some time point in development. And also, I'm not going to show you any data except one slide. We have also compared this data to be set with non-human primates, and many of them have differential expression differences in species differences. To show you how you can really find them, Tomomi stole this slide because she showed the same thing, so I, I was, it was too late to remove it. But, uh, <laughs> so here is an example of two genes. So this is a cerebellin 2. It's a gene that was discovered in, in, the, in the cerebellum, was called cerebellin 2. But actually what is really interesting, it has a really specific uh, I might, uh, prefrontal uh, gradient, and you can see beautifully labels prefrontal areas, labels all neurons. And if you look at the mouse, you can see the same thing in the mouse. However, here is an important thing. If you look at the human, it labels all layers equally. Basically, this is the bottom of the cortical plate or the top. But in the mouse, it's really highly expressed uh, 
in the upper layers. And this is a work from colleagues at Allen Brain Institute. And here is another gene that really was, I was so excited when I get this in situ, but, and then, uh, so here is a gene, MPY. You all know MPY, it labels interneurons, is one of the most commonly used markers of interneurons, and you can see interneurons, but also heavily labels a visual and some temporary areas, and these are probably layer four neurons. I think they are actually, what does MPY do that? We don't know that. If you look at the mouse, it's actually not expressed in, in the primary visual cortex, pyramidal cells or layer four cells. So here is a simple uh, species difference for a very, commonly studied genes, and I, Tomomi made the same point, and I wanted to finish with this slide. And yeah. So, a couple of points that I wanted to show. So basically, 90% of co protein coding genes are expressed in the human brain. That is going up. You have to keep one thing in mind, that this is a number that is a shooting, a moving target. The problem is that we are grounding the tissue. So, you know, we also have blood vessels, parasites, so, you know, it's not surprising, actually, just to be honest with you. So, uh, basically, if gene has two axons, will be spliced for sure. So basically, 90% of genes are somehow differentially regulated, either splicing or expression. We see substantial sex bias, the lyric expression, interindividual variations. I did not talk about it. Transcriptome is organized into either small or large networks of temporary, especially co-expressed genes. We think that they are somehow co-regulated. Prenatal development is most dynamic. I think it was. Neocortical transcriptome is globally symmetric, and it's globally symmetric and exhibits temporal hourglass pattern. What drives that pattern? That pattern happens before birth. What happens is that the, all those gradients are globally turned down and disappear. I don't know what the mechanisms, I can speculate on it. And also some developmentally regulated genes showed differences across species. So, this work was done primarily by these colleagues here. I'm not going to list them individually for sake of time. I'd like to my colleagues in Brainspan, many colleagues at Yale that basically introduced me to genomics and helped me do this. And I mean, I'm really grateful to all of them and funding. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Um, I'll go. Given that you're mushing the brain, it's not surprising you don't find asymmetry and the neuronal type differences in gene expression are washed away. So, so that's yeah, the well, odds of finding slight changes are going to be covered by the majority of the cells in the region, astrocytes and excitatory neurons. Yeah, so that's simple straightforward criticism that, you know. But there have been previous reports showing left and right differences this. We actually don't see any of it. And one of the problems is also sample size, you know. The more you add, it washes out because you also see inter individual variations and it's impossible to do this. It's really, and even at levels of neurons, I've been, I've been, this really changed my thinking because I was somebody who believed in genes, but I've been reading more and more activity dependent. I mean, look at the mommy's work. I mean, you know, it's a gene is expressed, but it really can change the dendrites and it's expressed in multiple areas. So there are two possibilities. One is what you said, it's, which I think is likely. Our study was not designed to uh, fish for those and detect them, so that's one caveat. And, um, but it also shows that, you know, that these differences are going to be minute. They are not going to be across the entire neocortical areas. And finally, I also do think that there will be a lot of effect of activity-dependent mechanisms. And brain is incredibly plastic. I mean, one thing I always tell people, I mean, if you have ever a child with hemispherectomy, they remove the whole hemisphere and their English is better than mine. And I have two hemispheres and cannot get rid of my accent. <laughs> and because their brain is plastic, and you know, if you remove left and right, they will develop language and almost, you know, I'm incredibly intelligent. They go to college and you would not recognize them. I have seen one. And I have accent, and I have two hemispheres. But it's really interesting how environment can change your brain. And I've been thinking more and more about it in the context of these problems. One possibility would be to do nuclear RNA. Yes. And isolate. Yes, we are doing that. Yes. <laughs> we are on the same. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful talk, Nanette, and probably it's, it's really related to your question, but and 
I don't know anything about these things, but uh, for the asymmetry, see, are there any possibility that thalamus is also controlling this asymmetric, um, you know, functioning? So uh, again, that's you know, if you look at the battlefield, I mean, it's incredibly plastic. I mean, one of my favorite paper was I forget the name. It was Japanese group 1982. Remember when they lesioned the future position of the battle cortex in the mouse, and battle cortex moved completely to auditory and develop completely. So your work is also showing, I mean, if you mess up the gradients, you can have two battlefields. So it's remarkably plastic. So it's, it's not, well, I mean, the only thing this tells you is not going to be simple. So that's basically what it tells you. And I was naive thinking that it would be that easy and also guided by some previous work. Then uh, we close this session. I would like to thank uh, Inat again for a great. <laughs>